The format's going to be very simple. We're going to ask all of our panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll have some questions that I received from the audience and on Twitter uh, about what they're looking to invest in these days, and then we'll open it up for the audience uh, at the end. Um, before, before we do that, just a brief observation as I've been sitting uh, in your shoes out there in the audience uh, throughout the day. The one, the one constant theme that goes through my mind is there's a lot of information here, right? Simon presented a tremendous amount of data. We have had companies, disruptors, established incumbents talk about mobile strategies, what's working, what's not. And there's a lot to absorb. And uh, the question comes to my mind, you know, what is the key takeaway as we walk away from this conference today? What is the one thing that we could, if nothing else uh, was left in our brain, what's the one thing we could take away? And so for me, the, the thing that's a takeaway for me personally that resonates me with uh, is what we talk about at Flurry every day. You know, everybody who works at Flurry uh, looks at a lot of data as well. And we say, well, what's the one thing we can remember? And it's that this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And it's an opportunity for a lifetime. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, so I, we have a kid. We live in the city, and we have a three-and-a-half-year-old. And, a year old. and uh, this is a true story. This happened this morning at 6 AM. Uh, he walks into our bedroom, and he yells at me. He says, Papa, where is my iPad? And he literally wakes us up. He's like, where is my iPad? I said, what? Not good morning. <laughs> like, how are you? Where is my iPad? And I said, it's downstairs. So he walks down the stairs, uh, opens my backpack, gets the iPad out, and he types in an eight-character password, and he opens it. And for the next half an hour or so, he's playing with the iPad. Um, I was in Bombay over the holidays uh, visiting my mom, who's 73 years old. And you know, she can't sleep as well as she used to. And so she goes to bed, bed pretty late, and she goes to bed at midnight. And the one thing that she does before she goes to bed is that she takes her iPad and watches the latest Bollywood uh, movie um, on her tablet. So if you think about it, from three years on to 73 years, from 6 a.m. in the morning to midnight, this device is with us, whether you live in San Francisco or you live in Bombay. And I don't think that there has been any other device or a medium, whether it's print or television or radio, that has ever had that much attention from all of our lives. I was at Google for seven years and was very lucky to be part of a growth curve that looked like an opportunity of a lifetime, and it was. But I still say that what Flurry and as a proxy, what we are going through as an industry in mobile is something that has never been seen before. So it's great to be here. And with that, let me open it up to our panel. Please introduce yourselves and talk about uh, your firms, and then we'll open up some questions. Sean? Hi, uh, Sean Carolyn from Menlo Ventures, <coughs> uh, managing director there. We have been investing in mobile for a long time, well before the great platforms like iPhone and Android. I think 2004, we invested in Moby TV, back when it was junky little J2ME apps on uh, phones that didn't work very well. And uh, on through today with uh, Siri, Flurry I'm representing with the swag <laughs> today, uh, uh, and Uber, a bunch of other companies. So just you know, exciting to see so much growth and so many exciting opportunities. Hi, I'm, I'm Chris Fralick, and I'm a partner with First Round Capital. We're an early stage firm that's uh, pretty active. We were listed as one of the five most active VCs by number of investments last year. We've, we're co-investors with a number of folks on the, on the panel in some cool companies like Uber and Fab and, and, and Flurry. And what one, one interesting note is that just back to what you were starting off with, of, what a unique point in time this is for a couple reasons. One is uh, you know, when, we, when we invested in the uh, company called Pinch Media, those of you who might recognize the name, was, was, one of the, was a company that merged with Flurry. It was May of 2008. And how many smartphones existed in the world then? Not a lot. And we sit here with billions, and in a couple more years it will be the vast majority of the human race, and that, like that, like how, f how fast do things, how often do things move really that fast, and dollars shift? Like so, I think it's a special time, and I think this, like this room, this conference is a pretty special place. Like it's four o'clock, and you guys are. This place is still packed, and um, 
this is like, you know, there have been mobile conferences going on for decades, but like someone described it as this is the new mobile, yeah. like, you know, there's not carriers in here. You are here. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> you are here. But yeah. anyway, it's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Maha Ibrahim, a general partner with Canaan <coughs> Partners. We're a global firm with about three and a half billion dollars under management. Uh, sweet spot of our investments are Series A, Series B, although we do some late stage and some seed. I like to think of myself as being on the forefront of mobile investment because my first deal at Canaan 13 years ago was a mobile deal and it was a raging failure um, for reasons I'm about to describe. <laughs> uh, it was an attachment to the then Blackberry, which is about this big and black and white pager, and it was a card swipe reader which had payment <laughs> capabilities wow. and all you of were, the content management. I was prescient, I was, was square. overly prescient <laughs> uh, because they were way too early to the market. At that time, BlackBerry was only on the cellular one network, for those of you who remember that, which was not in rural places that one would want to, to swipe a card. Um, so that failed, but um, through that was uh, got the mobile investing bug and now look at mobile investments. I don't even use the term investing in mobile anymore because mobile is ubiquitous. And now you're an investor in one of the leading mobile games companies, Kabam. Yes. We'll talk about that. Yes, we so. can talk about that now or later, whenever you want. Great. Sharon? Hi, I'm Sharon Weinbar. I'm a partner at Scale Venture Partners. We invest in the scaling phase, which can be relatively young in a company's life cycle. If you hit product market fit and your product starts to take off in the market relatively young, up through pre-IPO. But the, most of our investments are in that early growth phase. Uh, we've Personally, a funny experience, yeah, so probably when you made that investment, I was uh, in a company that was a bubble 1.0 company trying to do mobile email as a service. That was terminally early. Um, and then we, our firm has been active in mobile again since 2004. I think that was, the f that was the first year of mobile because that was the year that more than 10 million um, color capable handsets shipped. And uh, we made four or five investments there, a couple of which have gone public or exited. And then now in this next generation platform, you've actually just seen two of my portfolio companies talk, Everyday Health and Utest, um, and we have a handful of others here. Great. Uh, Sharon, let's start with you. We, there was a lot of discussion earlier today about platforms. You know, we got the iOS ecosystem, we got Android, and now Windows is growing really fast. Um, as an investor, do you have a preference for platforms? Uh, how do you look at companies that are cross-platform or perhaps focusing only on one platform? Does it matter to you? Right, I think in... In the early days of smartphone, so now, now we can set aside the term smartphone because that's all there are. But um, really, when <clears throat> iPhone had so much market share, you could build a, you could certainly build a suite of applications. You could almost build a company on iPhone only. But now that it's become much more fragmented, you really, I think, have to go cross-platform unless there is some capability that's only available in iPhone or Android. And I think you can't, you certainly can't go first or second to Windows Phone, um, much as I like the folks at Microsoft. So there have been a couple of notable examples of companies that got really extraordinary traction because they focused only on iPhone first, pa uh, sorry, Instagram being by far the, the most illustrious example, they utilized special features that were only available there, even though it was a, a networking application, so you would have naturally wanted to go cross-platform so that you could extend to more of your friends, which was the, the, um, the strategy that their competitors took. They got benefit of extraordinary user interface capabilities uh, and a beautiful app by sticking on iPhone first, and they were willing to go with a much slower growth rate in first. But I don't think that you can be that uh, constrained in this environment. So let's do a quick audience poll. How many of you are uh, looking to raise money this year? Raise your hand. Okay. So, and raise your hand like you're hailing a cab on a rainy day, not like, you know, you're your <laughs> boss at a Giants game. Um, and the cab is... Okay, so half, half the audience. And how many of you are developing only for one platform? Okay, so most people are developing for both platform, multiple platforms. It's great. So I'm going to go a little contrarian. Yeah, sure. And if you don't have that much money, I think you should prove yourself on one platform because you have yeah. only a few developers and so depending on the nature of the product, I mean, I think a lot of these, if it's a new idea and you have not proven the market, the iOS is, is big enough at least to show, hey, some people like this. Yeah. So you can spend twice as much 
and get to market in the same amount of time cross-platform, and if your product is wrong, then you're rewriting two products and you spend twice as much money. So that's the only yeah, caveat I would add. I mean, definitely agree in the cross-platform approach. I think the approach. other area actually where, there's an, where there is an opportunity to focus is actually iPad because there are some, because of the bigger form factor, there are things you can do there. Uh, so I've seen a number of shopping apps and things like that that really wouldn't work on a phone form factor but work extraordinarily well on iPhone. And iPhone, uh, sorry, iPad has so much market share in the tablet space yeah. right now that that's a great target. So let me take that a step further. Um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago when iOS and Android, but in particular Android, and then a couple of years before that with, with iOS, were really in their forma formative stages. There was an opportunity for app developers to get unfair distribution advantage because you're the first one on the platform. Just like when Zynga started out, when Facebook was opening up their APIs, Zynga mm -hmm. curried favor with Facebook and was able to get hundreds of millions of eyeballs to their games overnight and for free. And the early days of Android were like that, and to some extent still are, and the early days of iOS were, were like that. And once those, um, once those applications were able to grow at lightning pace, the question was then, you've been lucky, now you have to be good. Now you have to be able to make sure that those apps continue to be sticky and continue to monetize well. The, dis the disadvantage of doing an application today versus a couple of years ago is that you don't have million, tens of millions of people pouring in on a de novo basis into these, into these platforms. And therein lies the challenge of most mobile application developers today versus a couple of years ago. I think it's a very, very challenging investment environment from that, from that perspective. Chris? I'll just give one piece of advice I heard from an entrepreneur this morning about what platforms you develop first on. And there's a lot of evidence that Flory would give you that, you know, that, that iOS users spend more, engage more. Uh, Henry Blodgett kind of famously says, where are all the Android users? They don't show up on any, you know, reports. But this, this entrepreneur said, you know, if I, if I want to get something out and tested with people, I do it on Android first, because I can update it every single day without anyone's approval. And, you know, we, we hear all the time of just the, you know, the cues and, the, and uh, the time that it takes to get things done on, on the iOS side. So I just thought that was a clever way to think of it. Even if you throw it away and don't support it for a while, in the end, it gets the product right before you go on the other platforms. So speaking of, Maha, you talked about greenfield platforms. Being early in a platform, there's nobody else there. Is Windows potentially a opportunity <laughs> now for 2013? Well, it's, it's sort of an empty room, and you're the first one at a club? Yeah, I'm sorry to be so bitchy <laughs> about this, but no. I mean, I just can't. <laughs> yeah. We have Microsoft here. I know we have Microsoft audience, people so here, and I'm, you know, we're all hopeful, but it's the old adage of hope is not a strategy. There's just so much entrenchment in Apple and iOS and the ecosystem that Apple has built around the retail experience, the iTunes experience, the whole ecosystem, the whole value chain of Apple is one that locks users in for a very, very long time, if not permanently. And that's why you see Apple users every year continue to not buy the same amount they bought last year, but buy more, which is why Apple stock is so high. And that's why, as I'm looking out in this field of, of um, laptops, I don't see a non-Apple product in front of me. There might be one. That, to me, speaks volumes. Great. Yeah, I think Microsoft also ha Microsoft has a challenge because the two sources of kind of natural interest in Windows Phone come, one, from business users who are heavy Exchange Outlook users, and separately from the Xbox users where they've got, done a great job of integrating uh, XBLA and other features akin to Game Center in the Windows Phone OS. But those two, those two groups have very little overlap, and so they don't, they're not, they can't get the two, the, the multiplicative effect of using their existing strengths to go forward. Sean? Um, Chris, uh, we are in the app economy. This conference is about apps. Um, many of the companies here are some of the most innovative, disruptive apps, and you guys at First Round invest very early. So when an entrepreneur comes to you, walks to your door, and says, I have an app, how do you know that that app is going to turn into a company and a sustainable business over time? What are the kind of things you look for? Yeah, th that, that's always a big question of are you, are you backing a company that provides, you know, a, a solution for app makers like a flurry, more of a horizontal approach, 
or a single app in a world where there's hundreds of thousands of apps and it's harder to get, you know, get traction as you think. And so we, we, we end up asking ourselves that question a lot and, you know, and, and it, you know, it's a variation of a, of a question we ask in the venture world often, is this a feature or a company? And you're asking, is this an app? You know, it could be a great, you know, quote unquote, lifestyle app and could draw, you know, have some revenue coming out of it, but can it get really big is what all us VCs like to ask, ask uh, startups. But sometimes you see a, an app running and you just know it's, it can be really big. Hotel Tonight was a perfect example. When we met Sam and Jared, they had, you know, the two of them written the app and it was, it was just beautiful. And they had peeled away everything you don't care or want with a, uh, you know, with a hotel booking experience and turned it into like four clicks and three choices beautifully. And you just said, this, this really could change everything. And, and I'm confident that the existing players won't be able to go after that. And I think Uber was probably another one where you just, you just knew it was such a radical different approach that if they got it right, no, no guarantee that it really could become something meaningful. Yeah. On Hotel Tonight, one of the interesting stats I saw earlier, uh, so I think the Google presentation had that 92% of all hotel bookings on Priceline happen a day before arrival and from within a one mile radius of the hotel. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's sitting in the parking lot and booking a hotel. But that um, said, the, uh, uh, we, when we look at the top grossing apps of 2012, uh, the bulk of them were games. Right? That is where the iPad is monetizing. And one of my companies, Kabam, was fortunate enough to have the top grossing uh, app of, of 2012 in Kingdoms of Camelot Battle of North. Through that, though, what I've seen and what I've noticed is that in order to build a multi-billion dollar business, not a hundred million dollar business, not a fifty million dollar business, but a very sizable business, you need to have a portfolio of applications and they all need to monetize. They all need to monetize well. And in so doing, what I've, what I've gleaned in, in, in this whole experience with Kabam is it really does take a studio approach to get big in the mobile environment. And I'm leaving e-commerce and shopping applications to the side because I don't agree there. <clears throat> Sorry. But it, 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 it is more than just putting an app out there in the marketplace that's important. It's the whole marketing infrastructure. It's the co-marketing infrastructure that exists. It's knowing how much you have to pay for a user on one angle versus another. And that's sophisticated companies do that well and will continue to grow. Others, they, it's, it's going to be very much a hits-driven business, much like you know, the studio business. There's, every now and then, there's going to be a Blair Witch project. but. By and large, you're going to see the studios continue to amass scale. That's my view. Let's, let's stay up with Kabam for a minute. Um, it was not a mobile-first company. No. It started on the web. Mm -hmm. How did they navigate the mobile transition, and how did they choose the platforms, and yeah. you know, what is the path going forward for a company like Kabam? So, so they started a couple of years ago on iOS and decided to do iOS exclusively. And I understand why, although I was pushing them to do Android as well at that time, because I really thought that capturing the Android marketplace early would allow you to just you know, put your, put, plant the flag and then expand. Um, they expanded into mobile because they had to. Uh, we had to get off the Facebook platform, and we had to diversify. And we knew we, we could do it. Um, so we did. And we spent a lot of resources and a lot of knowledge that we gained about user monetization via the Facebook platform into mobile. And the transition's been a, a massive success. Um, yeah. Sharon and Sean, anything on the app? Is it an app? Is it a company? Uh, <clears throat> I think one way we look at this, and it's not just specific to mobile, but consumer businesses generally is um, you either get users for free, and usually you think of that as like a media business. So you have to grow virally, and then you have to maintain their attention. So there you think of, of one, the growth rate, viral growth. You can't pay flurry ads to get people in if you don't actually monetize. It's, it's more of a media business, you, you know, Facebook, all these types of things. And then the stats that we think about is, you know, how quickly are you growing based on virality, and then uh, almost like your media budget. So how many times do you go to the app per day? How long do you spend with the app? What's the retention curve over time? And, and Pinch released a famous study a long time ago, you know, 99% of apps, people were gone after the second day. So if, 
even as a free app, you need to maintain users uh, for a long time. And if you look at the early Facebook statistics, it was like that. It was a black hole. You know, people disappeared into it, went through 100 times a day and never came out, and it was growing virally. So that's like the media business category. And then uh, the other category, I think of like a hotel tonight or a game where you're actually paying, and we call that like the economic acquisition category. And there you're spending money, sending flurry big checks to get your ad in front of people. But then when they come into the app, they're either transacting directly with you, like virtual goods in a game, or they're transacting with an ecosystem of partners like Hotel Tonight, and money's being moved. And that's actually like the way Siri, before Apple bought them, uh, we were the very first investor there, was going where um, if you think of, of, of Siri as a way of, you have intent in your mind, hotel booking, interestingly, was the highest monetizing category they were playing <laughs> around with, and you say, oh, geez, I need a, a room tonight, four-star hotel. If you can become that habit, habit formation people are using every day and they're booking cabs or taxis or whatever, buying goods, that's a very powerful position to be from an advertising perspective. <clears throat> so you talk about growth, but not all growth is good, right? I mean, so you look, it's an example, Vidi. I mean, explosive growth and then no more. How do you validate growth as an investor? When somebody comes to your office and shows you great numbers, hockey stick, how do you know it's going to stick around? Any of you? Yeah, I mean, well, we look very closely at engagement and, and <clears throat> most importantly, return engagement, because especially when you're in those very early growth phases, a, you know, so the classic measure is the ratio of daily active uniques to monthly active uniques, but when you're in a very high growth phase, downloads count both in, act, in dailies and monthlies. And so it can look like you have a really strong uh, engagement ratio, but in fact that's, a, that's um, just a statistical anomaly because of, you have a number one in, the, you're adding one in numerator and denominator. So you have, to, you have to subtract out the downloads and look at that ratio. And, what people are doing when they get there. How long are they in the app? How much data are they putting in? I mean, one of our key tenants on consumer investing is you really want to be part of companies that are really important to their customers. And that the customer, and one of the key measures of, cus of customer importance is the customers are putting their key data in. So you have, in a, in a different realm, something like Evernote. It's not one of our portfolio companies, but it's become essential to people, right? It, it is your, your memory and it's shared across every place. Or another, one of our portfolio companies, Box.net. So it's, Box.net really exploded because of the proliferation of mobile and people wanting to access their information, share it uh, widely. But it's not, you know, it's not paying money for downloads and trying to monetize on advertising. It's providing um, customer utility. Chris, I, I think you have to. Well, I, what I've learned is you have to have some point of view, or the company has to understand what is driving the you know, up and to the right usage. And we had, we had a company that, you know, back in, to date it, like it was in the MySpace days, where over a weekend, they got a million users. And they, and, and it doubled again and doubled, and it was amazing on the way up. And they were buying servers to build, and they didn't, but they didn't really understand what it, why it went like this, and they really didn't understand why it was like a shark fin and went down this way. <laughs> right. On either side. And uh, like other examples would be like with, you know, when you like look at a, at Instagram, like what an amazing company. If, if you would have showed me the product and talked about pictures and filters, I would have never thought that was interesting at all. But if you get into like, it's no, it's the social network that's in the pictures. It's the commenting, liking. That's what it is. That's why, you know, that, that's what drove that usage. Like right now everyone talks about... Uh, Snapchat, like, and is that a little <laughs> feature or, you know, sexting. or like sexting out or like, what, what, what is that? And sexting. it's something that, <laughs> right. that, right. that, well, well, that you have, have to take. Or which had this There's only one use case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I use it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the primary use right, case. But the, you know, the video example is, is another example like the Facebook, um, like the Facebook canvas games where Viddy and social cam literally weeks after Viddy were there when Facebook enabled a new feature. And they got, you know, through relationships, they got early access to that feature. It was extraordinarily good for them for, you know, literally something like th 
three or six weeks. It was a very brief period of time, but where not only did they drive um, views of the videos, but it actually uniquely could drive installs. They could f the, the Facebook action could drive the end user to have to in download, install the application, the video application or social cam application in order to watch the video. So it was this very long user string that was initiated because the news feed was very prominently featuring notifications yeah. that were in fact kind of manufactured, right? So they, so as you watch a video, it would put this watch notice, but then there was a, a lot of machinations that were causing that too. So then as soon as Facebook started dialing down that, right, it, it, it became the new spam. It's like you used to get notices to come join this game with people, then all of a sudden it got, you know, watch this video, watch this video, watch this video, and they got a lot of pushback from the end users. As soon as they dialed it down, that's when the, uh, the other side of the shark spin appeared for both those applications. So I look at mobile investing, they're, they're, like I have two premises in, in order. One, does it monetize? And you look at, again, the top 20 list of grossing apps on, the I on iOS. And probably a third to a half are casino apps. Why? Because people spend money playing slots and blackjack, et cetera. And they spend a lot of money, like tens of millions of dollars a month in some of these apps playing slots. And this is not real gambling. This is just- But you're guaranteed to lose. You're, yeah, it's just <laughs> you're putting money in and you're just getting ego back um, or luck or something. But it's monetizing. So do people pay money? Second, do people pay money consistently? Is there user engagement and is that user engagement growing? Is it translating not to decaying uh, cohorts, but actually cohorts that grow over time? If you have that, you have magic. And then the third is, is there some sort of unfair distribution angle? One, two, three. If you don't monetize, it doesn't matter. So interestingly, my order is the opposite. Not quite, but the retention, I. It, I feel like if you get retention, you can monetize. Uh, and I'd say, you know, if, if you pitch Menlo, often if it's a mobile app, I often will ask for your Flurry login. We're at an analytics conference, and the two I look at is like conversion <laughs> rate to retain. So you install the app, what percentage of those people stick around, and then long term churn. So once you stick around for more than 30 days, what's your churn rate after that? And that shows at least habitual usage. So, I mean, there are some games as, as a really good one where people come in and monetize. I think these like lifestyle apps, you're trying to get on the home screen, you're trying to become part of somebody's life. Right. There it's all about retention. So if you are the product manager, it's like, okay, monetization feature, retention feature, growth feature, I'm often encouraging retention feature. So with all the discussion on analytics, Chris, you when you invested in Flurry very early, um, Knowing that it's an analytics company, analytics companies traditionally haven't made a lot of money. Uh, Omniture being probably a prominent exception. Um, what did you billion. look in there? What did you see there that made you say, "I want to back these guys"? Yeah, I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, companies are started in the analytics space, and with a, with a few notable exceptions, it hasn't been a great great space for for investment. They they, they tend to not be. Uh, big outcomes, and, and then folks have to, you know, they generally ultimately usually end up becoming an ad network. That's usually like plan B, B or C. But I think what we saw with the early team at what was then Pinch Media was were folks that were just enamored with this new world of, of, of apps. And, and little, you know, I love founder stories with conviction, you know, Greg, Greg Yardley and his co-founder, Jesse, were working at Wright Media, and the day that Steve Jobs across the street announced uh, the App Store, they quit their job and said, we want to go and do that. And you, you, like, it, it just changes, like this, is, yeah. this is, like this is, you know, it's 1910 and you want to get into the car business, <laughs> you know, or it, it's, it's, that, it's that big a thing yeah. that you kind of, put aside other you know, concerns about, is analytics a good business? And to this day, what does Flurry charge for analytics? Not a penny, but there's a, there's a real business that they, you can build when you have seven and 800 million users a month uh, that you reach. Let's get a couple of questions from the audience. I'm, I'm gonna ask one, but uh, we have people with mics, so get ready and uh, let's, let's have one on each side of the aisle. Um, so you talked about, I think you talked about the App Store launch. So I think it talks about the catalyst, or, you know, what's and the timing of the market. 
Um, there was a discussion earlier when I think somebody from Waze was talking about how the company could not have existed without all of us carrying smartphones around. Yep. So Sean, you've talked about the importance of context and you know, what is possible today with smartphones that hasn't been possible ever before. Uh, and maybe there are other things like that. So when you guys invest, do you look for a catalyst in a company and you know, say, well, you know, why now? Is that, a, is that an important it's, consideration? That, especially <clears throat> before, that, there was a lot of questions of, is this a mobile, is this, pretty much now if you're on the internet, you have a mobile site. At the beginning, it was, if, you had a, if it was a mobile app, was somebody from the internet gonna come kill you? And I think now uh, that kind of applies is what's new about the smartphone that isn't gonna, somebody from somewhere else is gonna come kill you, and a lot of that does come down to context. So here's a compute device, it's in your pocket, it's always connected to the internet, it's instant on, so you have a whole set of different use cases around instant information. You have a front-facing camera, which at some point we'll be able to detect you know, who you are, what your basic demographics are. It knows where you are, you know, apps like Uber, come pick me up right here, and then the driver, oh, I'm two minutes away, aren't possible. Accelerometers, location, I mean, there's, there's so much data that's actually there in the phone, and if you can actually accurately use that data to cut through the noise uh, and, and, and deliver the signal through the noise to the user, I mean, I think that's one of the things we liked about Flurry later on was, oh my God, you look at the Amazon recommendation engine and that's 50% of Amazon's revenue is, oh, you just bought this, you like this yeah. too, and you look at Flurry and it's like, wow, they're in you know 60% of iOS apps. I think that's gonna help with the recommendation engine of what apps people want. And they have an SDK that's embedded deep in the code, so they already have a relationship. People are looking at the portal, et cetera. So, so really using the data in a powerful way uh, on that small form factor to kind of get people exactly what they want, how they want it instantaneously is a big theme of ours in mobile. And if you comment on that? Okay. Well, Sharon? I think, I mean, just another thing, we, we've talked a lot about consumer facing apps on the panel, but one of the things, we we're just uh, in our annual planning cycle and talking about what areas we want to focus on this year, and one of the big themes is just how mobile has transformed everything about business. It's a big new platform shift akin to uh, web infrastructure replacing client server that replaced mainframe. Now it's mobile and that's changed the entire security paradigm for companies, the productivity apps, the way, you know, I was just with a company today that said, can't stand the Salesforce app, we're building something different. So I think across the entire software ecosystem, you can ask yourself, how does mobile impact this part? And you're looking at many, ten, you know, many $10 billion market opportunities that, that are going to go through a replacement technology cycle because of mobile. Great, let's take a question from the audience. Is there a question, there's a hand here. here. There's, okay, one there, let's start there. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, so I was curious, you, there's a lot of companies, you know, the largest companies like Facebook, Amazon, Apple, uh, Netflix, uh, how do you guys feel about uh, companies that are coming in to try to take a niche of their market, where it's basically, they do a lot, but they don't do everything great, necessarily, and, uh, and you know, if you could speak to that uh, from an investment standpoint. I'll give, I'll give you one example. We're investors in a company called Path, which you could describe as having, you know, subsets of features in other social networks like, like Facebook. That, that investment was largely on the team, uh, you know, Dave Moran and others that came out of Facebook, but it also was trying to take what was becoming this public, unwieldy, everyone sharing with everything and just saying, okay, we want to just share with your family or a smaller group and, you know, and, and they've, they've, they've certainly found traction. So, but, but by and large, I think a lot of investors would say, you know, well, it's easy for the big, the big guy to do that, so it, it can be a tougher road to go down. Right, can I give it, so we, so investors always ask about the TAM, the total addressable market, and so I think one of the things you should think about if, you, if you're thinking about building an application like that is how much money can you get per year from one of your customers and how many potential customers are there, and when you multiply those numbers together, is that, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, because you, no company gets 100% market share. Usually, 20% is the natural top stop. I mean, there certainly are companies with different examples, but but you have to think about, re, you know, in a media business, you're going 
good media companies will get between four and ten dollars per end user per year. Um, so that so you have to have a lot of end users to build a big company in that space. You know, business app. If you can get fifty dollars, then you don't need as many people to build a big company. But but on that way from an app to a to a company, you have to think about the market. It has to be yet another order of magnitude bigger. So question up here front. Do we have a mic? Great. <laughs> Going back to the items you guys listed and what you look for in an app, if an app is already making money, why do they need to go to you? And if they already have user retention, <laughs> why do they need to go to you? Um, there's <laughs> very few companies that are able to get to the level of scale that we're interested in by bootstrapping. That is, you can get, you, it can be a fine lifestyle business, right? There's a bunch of gaming startups out, or gaming private companies out there that are four guys or 10 guys and have made a good living off of what they do. The choice is, they and you would have to make the choice of, if I put $10 million more onto this fire, or $3 million more into this fire, will the fire become a conflagration, right? Will it become massive? And is that something I want? So it's, it's a personal decision as well as a financial decision. I mean, there's certainly, like we do seed to growth. So there's seed investments that you make or early investments, these guys do a lot of them too, where there's nothing and you can't go to the bank and say, give me a bank loan, here's my idea on a napkin. So at the early stages, it's like that. And then later stages, I think getting to be in a dominant position like Flurry is right now, just, you know, they've got very good market share in analytics. Uh, if you're the first one to kill a category and then you get public first, you command the overwhelming majority of the, the market capitalization okay. available. So it, it's, it pays to get some number of millions of dollars to accelerate your speed at which you achieve that mar market share and the eventual, uh, as the market share settles out. So you, Netflix, for example, I mean, they wish they spent a lot more money earlier on just cleaning up because those subs, you know, stick with them for a long time. Kevin, I'm going to make you come back up front. There's a hand up here. It's been so second row. I would have just add, too, that you know, money can help move things faster, but hopefully you're getting a lot more value from your investor than just the check they write and that they're helping you with lots of areas of your business, too. I guess that's what I was looking for. What yeah. else you have to contribute to? Oh, nothing. No, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 that was, that was we we the make day. you write a lot of reports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too many to list. Um, question here. Yeah, so earlier uh, there were a lot of talks about how the UI bar is getting raised. And, and Sharon, you started talking about enterprise versus consumer. And mm -hmm. I wanted to get your guys' thought on how the two kind of, the consumer versus enterprise, are they merging? I mean, it feels like we're all consumers and professionals and the line is getting more and more blurred. So what are your thoughts on that? Right, so cons consumerization of the enterprise is one of the big um, you know, big societal trends happening in business because cons for two things. One is consumers uh, have an expectation that the business environment that they operate in will have the same kinds of UI and same level of end user delight. Nobody wants to sit through the, you know, the, the even web app equivalent of the green screen and type stuff in. So the, so the bar for usage is getting higher. That's also partly driven by the prevalence of software as a service, which means for the vendor to be able to keep making money off the customer, the customers and users have to keep using the app because they didn't, do, they didn't sell in a million dollars worth of software license that became shelfware. So, so the business model shift is also requiring a lot more intimate relationship between the end users and the software. And then there's a separate trend driven by the very fast um, technology cycles that's bring your own device. So where companies, even the most security conscious companies, are allowing and in fact requiring their employees to purchase their own equipment but giving them a choice in that and then locking it down in certain ways. I mean, I had uh, folks at my house for dinner the other night who work in a, um, a very premier a consulting firm and it's a, it's a, you know, so it's a very high margin business. <laughs> uh, so they ha it's not like the company doesn't have capital to spend on their end users, but they require the end users to buy their own phones, but then the phone uh, has special security software on it that wipes it, is, you know, is, if, if it's even, they have an inkling that it's lost, the whole thing is wiped. Um, so, 
<laughs> yeah, but it's uh, but then the but then the people get to choose what they want to have instead of the you know it's only the investment bankers who are left on on Blackberries now. <laughs> Okay, um, let me ask a question. If there's more for the audience, we'll take them as well. Um, 2013, it's the beginning of the year. Let's say you're going to make only one investment this year in a mobile company. I know you'll make more than one, but let's say, hope, let's say you make at least one. For each of you, what would, what would you want to see in that investment? What would an ideal investment look like to you in 2013? You can also answer by saying, what would you not do? What are the things that you're not going to do this year? Yeah. So I spend about 50% of my time on the enterprise infrastructure side. So that's cloud-based models, elastic computing, virtualization, storage, et cetera. And I just think it's really fun, even though my partners think it's super boring. Uh, <laughs> but the amazing thing about that, to your question, is, and to Sharon's answer, so much of this is getting distilled up to something that looks very, very pretty and is eye candy and is iPad enabled. It's all mobile. The UI has to be, it's, the UI has been, it's, it's to another level. And this goes for games, obviously, because the, the high fidelity games are moving to the iPad, but on the enterprise, the high fidelity apps are becoming so much more important, even with elastic compute um, analytics and application performance manage it, management. All of that is converging onto mobile. So that's where I see myself investing. Yeah, uh, kind of on that theme, oh sorry. What, one unsolved problem I think both for consumers and for businesses, especially as you have the, all the, the assets are now at the edge, whether they're my personal things that are on my phone, uh, you know, multiple different phones, pads, et cetera, um, or their business applications that are hosted by different SaaS vendors is the whole unifying identity, credentials, mm -hmm. and the equivalent of single sign-on across a distributed uh, environment, I think is a huge unsolved need. And you know, personally, I would love for someone to solve it for me, but I think it's a very strong business need that will have, uh, will build a big company there. Chris? I, I think w one of the, probably commerce would be the area that I find the most interesting with with mobile from from a couple of angles one is just you know the 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 new visual web things that like pinterest represents so well and how those that's engaged users in brand new exciting ways and how well that plays out on tablets is really interesting and just commerce and how different it is with mobile whether it's people in stores and what they're checking or doing or searching there or uh, we, we've, we, one of our portfolio companies that, that we share with Menlo is Fab, and they, they find an iPad user is something around twice as valuable to them as another user. And that they, you know, you can read Jason's blog uh, at betashop.com, he tells everything about the business. But that like they, he feels it's kind of, you're actually able to interact with it. It's a different experience when you're, when you're on your tablet and it's, and it's you know, they've, they've turned into one of the fastest growing e-commerce companies in the world with a big bet uh, and recognition of the value of mobile early. And so what else can we do that with? Uh, mine would be what I think of as like perfection of the experience. So. We all want to get stuff done. You know, you spent 24 hours yesterday and you did a certain set of activities. And if, if the next day one of those activities could be done with zero effort, that could be magical. And, and Uber, I think you, you feel that when it's like you hit a button. By the time I'm downstairs, there's a car there. And then you get out and you like never pick out your wallet. And, and once a consumer or an enterprise user, we're very excited about consumerization of the enterprise too. Once any end user has an experience like that, they will never leave. It's, uh, it's like, oh, that's a solved problem for me. And I think the phone is getting to the point where because you have PII, personal identifiable information on the phone, uh, and it's trusted, and it's with you, and it's on, if you start to solve these problems for people, I think you'll own them, own them forever. Uh, scan is another one we're invest investors in where the QR, they're kind of making the QR code come alive. and so. 
I'm imagining QR codes on things, but all of my you know, credit card information, everything I know is on the phone, and so I scan the QR code and I never fill out a form again, right? Uh, all the stuff you get from school or when you're going through customs or this or that, you just scan it, it knows my data, and it, it says, do you want to, you trust that? Yeah, so things like that where you just save people time and effort and you become part of their life. Chris, just, just on the point of, like, it, it's occurred to me that one of the things that, one of the reasons everyone's got Macs for the most part in front of us and, and iPhones is they've perfected the art of the upgrade. Upgrading <laughs> is a no-brainer, easy, and it makes it easy. Like in the old days, remember when you get a new PC? It'd be like <laughs> brain surgery to, <laughs> to figure out how, how and when you were going to do yeah. the upgrade yeah. and they don't give you tools to like. So I think you know, they've made it almost like throwaway, like, easy decisions. Yeah. And something Great point. Can... Last question from the audience and then I have a, a, a final one as a wrap-up. Uh, does anybody have a question there? All right, no questions from the audience. Okay, so yeah, final question. So um, think back in history, 1994, Netscape goes public, I think, right? And then 1995, Bill Gates writes the first internet memos, I think, internet tidal wave. And I think we could reasonably argue that that shifted the balance of power from the desktop economy to the web economy, right? So it's 2013, we're sitting here, we're talking essentially about a desktop economy in the mobile world today. We have platforms and gatekeepers and tech clients. So question for all of you, or anybody who wants to take a shot, will we see a memo from Tim Cook or Larry Page that will herald an era where we move to a mobile web world and this desktop era in mobile will end? Any predictions of that? Will, will that happen? If so, when does that happen? Anyone? Desktop, er, what do you mean by desktop era? Moving away from an app economy to a sort of HTML5 or a cloud okay, mobile next. web economy. Yeah, just similar to the, what happened on the PC. I, I think, uh, I mean, one inevitability, I like these things that are like technical inevitabilities, is uh, things will disappear in the cloud. I mean, I think Larry Page specifically is a very forward-looking guy, and I, I don't know if he'll send a no-shit memo, but <laughs> I think the idea that, that this right now has to do a lot, I have an iPhone 5, but eventually there'll just be panes of glass that are connected to the internet, and you can speak to them, and all your data lives in the cloud. I mean, that to me is a technical inevitability. I'm on the board of a company called Roku in the over-the-top TV space, and it's like, you just, you know, they're 50 bucks now, and they're going to be 20 bucks. And, and so any screen is going to be able to light up with any bit on the internet. And then as voice UIs get better. So I think the, the importance of the platform itself will diminish over time, and the importance of the data and the service and the user experience and the network effects will go up. So when we looked at Siri um, for the Series B, I fell in love with it because I saw the promise of what it could be. And you know, unfortunately, it's, it's under Apple, and it's not evolving to the extent that I wanted it to, and probably Sean, but you did well with it. Um, but it's the idea, to Sean's point, of having the phone work for you, whether it's in a personal assistant manner or a media consumption manner. And we will get there. Like There will be technologies that enable that. And when we do, I think it, it will be revolutionary for all of the devices that are here and in our home. In the meantime, though, mobile discovery is the key problem that every single app developer faces. And I, I struggle with investing there because you know that it has to happen, but at the same time, so does everybody else, and discovering the mobile discovery app <laughs> is a problem. Um, so there, there will be, in my opinion, somebody who takes the lion's share of that mobile discovery world to the next level, um, and that hopefully will be a breakthrough, much like when Google came out. Great. Yeah, I think to a, a necessary condition to achieve what you're looking for, which is the d diminution of applications and the rise of something like mobile web, means there still has to be billions of dollars invested by the carriers in upgrading the service level. I mean, you still, I, you know, multiple times today, 
I got no service. Not even like one little tiny bar, no service. Uh, being at CES all last week when there were a lot of devices, no service. Yeah. So there's, there's still that, that last mile of the infrastructure that really needs to be carried through, um, needs to be carried through worldwide. Uh, and then indoors, you're also seeing all different kinds of things happening where the, car you know, between the carriers, and I was with a company today that was talking about actually blocking cell access inside the stores so that they could get, so that they could intercept showrooming, you know, so there, so I think that there's a lot of play that's going to happen out in the air interface before the platform thing is, is baked. That's a great point, Sharon. You t I mean, we, we talk about consumer and business apps, but there is a lot of investment to be made in infrastructure as well, as you point out, and that's a tremendous opportunity for everybody in the room. So uh, let me end here. Thank you for your participation, and thank you, audience, for great questions. I'm going to end on one uh, note here, and Peter is waiting in the wing. So Peter, why don't you come up here, because I'm going to embarrass him. Uh, uh, he, deserves, in the he deserves. He deserves. I have a mic, and it's on. You do have the last word, Peter, so it's okay. Um, so you know, I was thinking, if if this is an opportunity of a lifetime and for a lifetime, why is it called Source 13? Don't we have a Y2K problem? We only have two digits there. <laughs> So or is it logarithmic or exponential? What's the complaint? The complaint is that oh there's not enough The complaint is that you didn't think big enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to last forever. Right? Lucky, We're going to do a source 14 and 15 and 16. And, well, next and what year happens be, after source 99? There'll, there'll be two more this year. There'll be two more this year, yeah. We might do it in the spring and the fall. If we're living long Are we going to invite these people back? If you By and I are here, so I will figure out how to This is the value out of investors. <laughs> this is my value. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter. You, as always, right, you, you have the last word. I have, my safe, I have my safe pillow. <laughs> well, thank well, look, you. look, I wanted to say um, we let it run a little long on purpose because uh, it is very, it's very rare to get so much, uh, to get a brain trust like this together. And we wanted to have um, several experienced, seasoned, savvy investors really talk about uh, and what I think was a great, open, honest conversation about what they really think about what they look uh, for in, in an investment, in an opportunity. They meet with a lot of companies, some pitch better than others, but it's really amazing to get this kind of insider view. So I wanted to give them a round of applause. And thank you so much for making Source 13 a great event. Thank you, guys. Thank you.